routine at a different different pace. All right. Welcome, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us for this edition of our Books in Common Northwest virtual event series, which we created alongside Madison Books in Seattle and Country Bookshelf in Bozeman. I'm Lane Jacobson, the owner of Polina Springs Books in Sisters, Oregon. And um, before we really get into things, I'm going to go over a few housekeeping items. Um, real quick, right off the bat, I wanted to mention something that Polina Springs is working on here in Sisters. Uh, most of you are probably aware of or being affected by the wildfires happening on the West Coast right now. Um, some communities, neighboring sisters were burnt off the map completely. And we have a lot of residents of those communities um, in our town right now. We're partnering with some other businesses in town to put on a virtual benefit concert and organize a fundraiser um, in which businesses from all, all over town will donate a percentage of their sales to a relief fund. We don't have any details yet, um, but if you're in Sisters, keep an eye on the Nugget newspaper next week. And if you're tuning in from somewhere else, um, you can go to polinaspringsbooks.com for details. Nothing is up there right now, um, but over the next few days, we'll be posting more info and you can tune in from afar to watch um, some of our local musical talent. Um, we are recording this event and it will be viewable on booksincommonnw.com as well as the Books in Common Northwest YouTube channel after the event concludes. There are um, links to buy your copies of these books um, in the chat and we'll be dropping that back into the chat um, periodically throughout the evening. Just click on the logo of your favorite supporting store to uh, fill up your shopping cart to support our authors this evening. If you have any questions for either or both authors, just click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and we'll get to them as time allows. You can also see the questions other folks have asked and even vote on which questions you'd most like to hear the answer to. You can also leave um, comments in the chat window to the right. If you run into any tick, tech issues along the way, or hopefully not any tick issues, um, weird season for that. We recommend you first try exiting and re-entering the webinar. If you can't get back in, we hope you'll visit the Books in Common Northwest YouTube channel to watch live there. This is a shared creative space and we want it to remain safe for everyone and we ask that everyone in attendance be respectful of everyone else who has joined us tonight. Um, difficult subject matter may be discussed, but offensive comments and or questions will see the user dismissed from this event. And with all of that out of the way, um, we can get to the fun stuff. I am so excited for tonight's event. Um, we've got two very fantastic authors and this is sure to be uh, a very entertaining conversation. Um, Chuck Polinick is the author of the new novel, The Invention of Sound, and has been a nationally best-selling author since his first novel, 1996's Fight Club, was made into the acclaimed David Fincher film of the same name. His work has sold millions of copies worldwide and includes novels, short stories, graphic novels, coloring books, a travel guide, a collection of essays, and a memoir. Uh, Grady Hendrix is the author of the new novel, The Southern Book, Club, Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires. He is a novelist and screenwriter based in New York City. He is the Bram Stoker award-winning author of Paperbacks from Hell and the Shirley Jackson and Locust Award winner nominated, Locust Award nominated author of Horror Store, my best friend's exorcism, and we sold our souls. Without further ado, I'll pass it off to Chuck and Grady um, to get the conversation rolling. Uh, so Chuck, where are you, Portland or? Portland, Portland. So are, are you getting any fire stuff? Yeah, it's, uh, it's like permanent, uh, the fog, it's horrible. Yeah, it's, but you guys aren't in any danger, right? Because you seem pretty relaxed, so. No, no, I'm just loaded. Um, okay, good. Yeah. It's the best way to go about these things. Um, and so now I have to also ask, because 2020 is such a tremendous dumpster fire of a year, how's your pandemic been so far? <laughs> That's so conversational. How, how is your pandemic? I think during the Middle Ages, probably during the Black Plague, they talked that same way. So how yeah, is a the... Black Ubos. plague going for you. Yeah. yeah. You've got some the great boobos there. In the in the 80s, it was very much like that. How's your AIDS? So yeah. <laughs> your 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 Kaposi sarcoma looking good. Yeah. Well anyway, it's been please. 
Yeah, no, well, I was going to say, because it's weird. I don't know. Do you work on books way in advance? Like, do you have something cooking right now or? Oh, yeah. Yeah, boy. Uh, I'm usually working on two or three books now, and I throw away two out of them, two out of the yeah. three. Yeah. That sounds, yeah, that sounds like a good ratio, actually. Um, uh, but I was going to ask because, <clears throat> you know, I've, I'm, uh, I just had a rewrite on my book that's out next year because I had to knock everything back to 2010 because it's not a pandemic book. And it was, you can't set something in 2020 without masks and Black Lives Matter and all the, and the wildfires. I mean, so are you trying to deal with, like, you know, are you knocking stuff into the past? Are you just pretending everything isn't going on? Are you slapping all your characters into N95s? You know, no, uh, seriously, uh, I see how fast history cycles right now and how the crisis of one moment is forgotten in the next moment. So I am not gonna chase current events. I'm not gonna chase technology. Last year, two years ago, I had a huge back and forth about whether I should use YouTube or Instagram stories uh, or, or TikTok. No, screw it. I'm not gonna chase technology. It's gonna be this one classic thing and I think that's the writer's job is not to follow the culture, but to lead the culture. Um, so no, no masks. Yeah, no, it's it's weird because it's it's less. I mean, it's yes, part of it's the chasing of the trends, but part of it's also like, I mean, I really think this is some permanent changes. Like, you know what I mean? I think masks are here to stay. Um, you go to Hong Kong or somewhere or Japan, and it's just a part of streetwear. Yeah, in my books, you know, Fight Club. <laughs> was before cell phones, Fight Club was before the internet, yeah. and it still holds up. And so I think if you have enough, if the, the forward momentum is enough, if the novelty is enough, you know, if it's a strong enough narrative, you don't need to really worry about the set dressing, things like that, mm. unless Fair it's enough. really integral. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I was gonna ask, invention, I really enjoyed Invention of Sound. I, um, I have to ask though, because a lot of it's about Foley artists. Um, and I'm assuming people who are on this call know what a Foley artist is. They put in the effects of, sound effects of people doing normal things in a movie uh, that are usually dubbed in later. Um, did that give you like Foley-itis? Can you watch anything now without being super attuned to the Foley work? You know, I don't think about the Foley work because it's usually such naturalistic sounds, but I hate dubbing when you can tell a line has been overdubbed. Mm. Do you, do you remember Galaxy Quest? Oh yeah. There's that wonderful sequence where Sigourney Weaver is looking down that tunnel of obstacles that are all smashing together in different ways. And she says, what the hell? But her lips say, what the fuck? And that's such a wonderful mismatch because the entire audience sees what she's actually saying. Uh, yeah. And so overdubs like that, if they're badly done, they they bounced me out of the story so instantly where somebody yeah. had to go to the booth and I could see they're in the booth over and over trying to match that sequence and it's just agony. Yeah. Um, well, it's interesting because I was thinking about it when I was reading the book and I was like, you know, there's Foley work. I, I, I used to do sound engineering or I studied it, but it turned out it was all useless because um, I learned analog and the world went digital. But uh. I, it was the, the, the year I graduated, they switched to digital. Um, but uh, I was really seeing though, there are these Foley things that we've all taken for granted in movies these days. Like the fact that computer screens make noise in movies. Yeah, you know, I've never seen a computer screen in my life make a noise, but in a movie, they beat, they click, they do all this stuff. And I was like, you know, I get it. Like we spend so much of our lives staring at screens. And, and it's hard to make that interesting for a reader. And so much of invention of sound is about people listening to things. I mean, the internal life is going on, but literally, objectively, your characters spend like two thirds of this book sitting and listening very, very hard. And I was just curious, like, what was, were you really attuned to that? Were you worried about it? Uh, I was kind of obsessed with, with movie narratives, especially I grew up listening to radio plays like mm. Inner Sanctum, where sure. it was all about sound effects. It was all, all about theater of the mind, they used to call it. And you would lay in bed with your transistor radio, listening to these old 
horror shows. But beyond that, I liked movies that had a kind of narrative thread that was entirely audio, like uh, Session 9. There's oh, a sure. narrative thread where it's just all recorded therapy sessions. And they're used as this fantastic audio bridge that just plays across montages. Uh, another one I loved was uh, in Alien, the original Alien, where Veronica Cartwright finally gets it at the end. We don't see her butchered by the alien. We hear her over Sigourney Weaver's headphones, oh, yeah. that gasping scream that suddenly cuts off. And that is so much more effective than the kind of horror close-ups they were using for everybody else's deaths. That, that scream that cuts off so suddenly uh, is, is terrifying. And then Sigourney Weaver's reaction as she rounds the corner and finds their, uh, their brutalized bodies. Uh, right. In, uh, Clute, do you remember Clute with Jane Fonda? Oh yeah. At the very end where the, the villain is menacing Jane Fonda about to kill her, he pulls out a tape recorder and he plays the death scene and the ultimate death scream of the woman that Jane Fonda knew that was his last victim. And so it's just kind of how effective the audio is in presencing violence. It's, it's, a, it's a form of tableau horror. There's so much horror, so much thriller, where you come across the death scene after the fact. Because in The Alienist, in Da Vinci Code, in Seven, the movie Seven, you cannot show the killer doing that horrible thing because the audience would leave. So you show a tableau of the effect after it, and then you unpack it through forensic language. But you can have tableau horror by just having simply the recording of that death moment and have it be just as effective. And that's what I was kind of studying and going for. Mm -hmm. Well, it's also interesting because so much of the book, you know, audio has this real connection to the afterlife, right? This idea of presence with absence. Um, and you've got people like uh, Rodive and his electro voice phenomena, and, you know, putting a recorder in an empty room to record the voices of the dead. And there's so much of that, of people listening to dead people, whether it's their laughter or their speech or their sound work in this. Um, it always reminds me of that old uh, corny story about, you know, sitcom laugh tracks being recorded, you know, and those people all being dead now, um, which is never as creepy as I think people telling that story think it is. I'm always like, good. Um, but were you, do you think of this sort of as a ghost story in a way? Because yeah, there's you know, so much absence? When, uh... When my mother died of cancer in 2009, I confessed to a friend that I, I couldn't delete her voicemails. And every oh, yeah. 100 days, I would press, uh, I think it was press nine to keep them for, for 100 more days. And I just kept on pressing nine because I couldn't let go of the sound of her voice, leaving these very mundane messages. And the friend that I talked to, she kind of brightened up and she said, I do this I've done that for 10 years with my best friend who died of cancer. For 10 years, I've been pressing nine, every 100 days pressing nine, instead of pressing seven to delete. And when you find out that that kind of behavior is universal, it's such a sense of relief that you're not the crazy person. Right. But there was such a pattern and such a, a demonstration of that with people who got messages during 9-11 from loved mm -hmm. ones who were trapped in the towers or on, on doomed aircraft. That, that to seem like the ultimate kind of holding on to the dead person, holding on to that one last thing they said. Uh, a friend of mine, if I may, uh, as his father was dying, he wanted to record his father's story. So he took, took a tape recorder to his father's uh, hospice bed. And you know, that never goes very well because his father was heavily drugged. But at one point his father said, Rick, uh, I, I, I don't want to be rude, but my brother has just come in and he wants, he wants to talk to me about something. So I, may I talk to my brother for a moment? Your, your uncle, Ted. And Rick said, sure. And a moment later, his father died. And he, his father had all said, your uncle, Ted, has come in and he's sitting in the corner and he wants to talk to me. And 
I don't think Rick has ever told anybody that story except for me. And Rick said that he had that on re recorded. It was tape recorded. And he has years and years later never gone back to, to hear his father say that ever again because it frightened him so much because his uncle Ted had died years and years before. And it was such an odd sort of demonstration of that sort of idea that the dead come back to kind of help us at the end. Uh, right. And that Rick had a tape recording that seemed to confirm that. But again, it demonstrates the haunting effect of audio recordings. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. There's actually, you know, another angle on those, which is, you know, when you take a picture with an iPhone, if it's set on that live setting, it grabs that, it grabs a live second, I think. And you can hear whatever's going on. I actually have a friend who passed away and I have a live thing and I can just, if I tap it, you can just hear them say in the background, what are you? And that's it. That's all you get of it. <laughs> it's like, and I have no idea what they were saying and what they were asking. Like all I remember, it's just become this sample that's meaningless now. Um, well, just, you know, speaking, and so talking about invention of sound, the other big part of this book, which I was, it's funny. Um, I don't know if you're prescient or not, but it's about, you know, abducted and murdered children. And um, we were, those of us who were born in the 70s or earlier, we're all got to live through the satanic panic when this idea of our children being going missing and being abducted by strangers and all this stuff just swept the country and gave everyone permission to act like an absolute creep which is also going on now with sort of the Pizzagate QAnon thing that's happening. Um, and so I wanted to ask, do you remember the satanic panic when it was going on back in the I guess, 80s, really? The definitive book about that is called Satan Silence. And it's all about the McLaren daycare center. It's all about uh, when rabbit screams, it's all about how that mania went crazy on the West Coast and then worked its way to England and then kind mm -hmm. of came back. And how many people went to prison for yeah. huge chunks of their lives and never did anything? Yeah. But it is kind of an ultimate fear. So it comes back over and over. Yeah. Well, it's it's one of those things that I've seen pop up in your books a few times in your stories, people being falsely accused, the, the threat of an accusation of molesting or doing harm to a child, um, you know, or, being used as leverage. In Choke, in Choke, this is this very dark comedy about the uh, uh, the man, uh, the narrator in, in my book, Choke, that was made into the Sam Rockwell movie. And he he allows this kind of uh, uh, drama therapy by accepting the guilt of these demented patients who think that he's the, the, the person who's destroyed their life as years before. And he says he confesses to it and he allows them kind of a completion. But then later they go to the police and they say he was the one who actually did it. And it becomes this very dark comedy about how he's taken on these sins and he's gonna be punished for these sins. Uh, so I'm not sure why I do that. Maybe it's being Catholic, <laughs> so. He is yeah. so guilty about everything. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, right? Because it's, it's a real weaponized form of storytelling. Um, you know, this idea of, you know, I don't know if you remember, gosh, I think it was Washington State in the 80s during the satanic panic, when a police chief of a small town confessed to being in this cult that was molesting his children, because he said, well, they say it, they, they're pretty convinced I am, my kids are, and why would they lie? So it must be true. So I did it. And he confessed and, and would elaborate on it, expanded it, and it became this really crazy game of sort of Russian roulette storytelling. Um, but it's weird because I think we're all writing books for an effect, but we're never going to have that kind of effect. <laughs> Unless... You know, it's, uh, it's interesting because it's, it, in it's a way it's, it's a little similar to cancel culture than in a way it was a, a really ultimate form of cancel culture where, uh, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Well, and one of the things too, though, about writing about child abduction, right? You run into this really, uh, it's a real tightrope. I mean, there's the mawkishness on one side because gee, you wanna wring a tear from your reader or get them upset. You're gonna write about children in danger. 
On the other hand, you know, it, it becomes something that can easily take over a book. Was that like a balance you were really aware of trying to keep? Well, you know, I think there's two, two big dynamics that drive a lot of fiction. And there's the dead parent and dead parent seems to drive a lot of comedy that so much, especially when you think of television or movie comedy is based on the fact that someone's parent has died. And you think of all the Disney movies and it's either the dad has died or the mother has died. The television, it tends to be split a little equally with maybe even more dead dads because especially through the seventies, you know, one day at a time, the Partridge family, Nanny and the professor, uh, it was always about the dead dad, the ghost of Mrs. Muir. It was always about the dead dad, uh, Di uh, Diane, uh, what was it? The nurse show that was so, it was the first primetime series in the sixties with a black lead, Diane Cannon. And oh, okay, I don't, yeah. She had a young son and she was a nurse and her father, her husband, the father of her child had been killed in Vietnam. So comedy always kind of comes from the dead parent, but so much of drama comes from the dead child. And so a dead child is a way to instantly indicate that this is a drama, that this is something that is the dead or the missing child, that this is something to be taken very, very seriously. Um, they're both defaults, but they don't really get recognized. Yeah. Well, it's like the child's point of view where the death is affecting the parent is the funny point of view. And then the parent's point of view is the serious one. Um, parents are serious, man. Um, but so, yeah, so, but it's also one of those things, the other one that never comes up and that I don't think as writers you're allowed to touch is the dead animal. I mean, that's... No, the dead animals everywhere. It used to be really? a lot more. Yeah, yeah. old yeller. Um, oh, right, right. But, you know, I mean, would you kill an animal? I mean, would, wouldn't you think hard before killing an animal in one of your books? I kill a rabid dog in rant, a pug dog. Right. Go crazy. Uh, but I also really tie it back to the, the precedent, which is old yeller, which mm -hmm. is... Uh, What's the other, uh, uh, the, the yearly? Sounder. Sounder, yes, exactly. Yeah. Which is a weird name for a dog. And Dennis is out there right now. And Dennis can speak to uh, uh, Pet Cemetery, which yeah, is about the sure. dead cat. Well, so, and Cujo is just the old yeller with uh, rabies. <laughs> it's old yeller extended over two hours. It's the last <laughs> act of old yeller. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so one of the things that I thought was really um, interesting is a, a thing that you talk about a lot is minimalism in your writing um, and, and this need to sort of unpack these moments that writers really take for granted uh, rather than glossing over something with so-and-so is angry. They, what does that look like? What does that feel like? How is that on the body? And I, I found that, I, I think I read an essay you wrote about that years ago and it really was huge for me. But I ran into this problem because I, I have to now be super careful about um, people wetting their pants and vomiting because they're the two easiest physical shortcuts for a writer to externalize emotion. And there are two things that don't happen that often in real life. So is this something you have to, a tendency you have to watch because they're easy crutches? Uh, you have to, if, if you were to vomit, you have to unpack vomiting not to, you know, right. uh, press the pun. But uh, there's an old trope about if the writer doesn't know what, to, what happens next, describe the interior of the protagonist's mouth. And once you know that, it's suddenly her mouth was dry. His mouth was flooded with spit. Uh, he couldn't spit to save his life. There's all these ways of describing the oh, yeah. dry mouth. Because the interior of the mouth is this such a sympathetic place to go to. And uh, in my book, Lullaby, I also thought that the soles of the feet are such a sympathetic place to go to. Uh, if you see the movie uh, Midnight Express, they are so constantly whipping Brad Davis's soles with, uh, with wire whips. 
because it makes everyone in the audience just cringe in pain. So in, in Lullaby, the soles of his feet are constantly being kind of mutilated. Uh, right, stomping on the models, right? Right, so it's always yeah. about a, finding a different new way that's organic to the situation of just of evoking a sympathetic physical response. Yeah, well, and that's one of the things, right? Externalized physical responses. I mean, it's a it's a limited palette, so it's you really have to to dig deep on those to find a new way to write them. You know, it's it's kind of digging deep, but I think it's more about paying attention, paying attention to what sure. makes you cringe, and pay, paying attention to what makes other people really cringe. You know. I can't count how many movies I've seen, starting with uh, Stir of Echoes and The Ring with Naomi Watts, where we see someone's fingernail being broken. There's, and in The Ring, we see that fingernail being broken off over and over and over. And in uh, Stir of Echoes, we see Kevin Bacon getting that psychic image of the fingernail being busted off over and over. And every time that happens, our whole body just cringes mm -hmm. uh, and we, we wait in, in tension for the next time because we know it's going to be shown again. Right. Uh, but it's effective. Yeah. Well, it's, a, it's also an arms race, right? You have to watch the escalation. Like if someone broke one of my, I, I, I had a fireworks accident as a kid and blew off a fingernail. I'm 47. I'm still talking about it. I won't shut up, you know, <laughs> like that, I was 11. Um, you know, it's one of those things you have to, it's judicious. You can't over rely. Um, what, where do you feel like, um, where do you feel like you sort of found your groove? I mean, obviously you've been writing for a long time and all that. And, and, and maybe you feel like you had it from your first book, but to really feel like you, because I feel like the only way to learn how to write books is to write books. And so at what point did you feel like, I'm doing this in a way that I'm comfortable with, where I feel in control of it, or do you not feel in control of it at all? You know, I think at the moment, I feel like I'm in control of it. Um, uh, I'm lousy. If I, if I know, I really honestly think that the whole process has to be reinvented every single time because there is no universal point of view. There is no universal kind of way of structuring information that, that the story has to be reinvented. The, the, the storytelling has to be reinvented to be appropriate to each narrator. And so that's why across time, all of my books have been kind of these kind of crapshoot experiments. Uh, some of them work probably better than others and why each of my short stories tend to be these really, really voicey uh, experiments to, to see how, you know, how much I can burn the language or how much I can press a kind of uh, a conceit or an effect before it really becomes annoying or quits working. So I think that everything has to be a big experiment, a big departure from the last thing. But when you say, you know, uh, when you're talking about experimenting with a book, a book's a big thing to experiment with. I mean, if you've got to also pay a mortgage, pay your rent, pay bills, um, it's sort of like a game my dad played when he was little with his sister, which was how close can I get a match to your hair before it catches on fire? And there's really only one way that experiment ends. So how do you know if you push something to the point where it becomes annoying or it doesn't work? short of you publish a book that doesn't work? And then how do you judge whether it works or not if you're happy with it? Because you wouldn't put it out if you weren't happy with it. You know, and that's why workshop has always been so important for me because workshop beca uh, became a kind of primary way of, of testing material and seeing if it would people would engage with it and seeing if people would develop it from their own experience by saying, oh, that happened to me. I, I can tell you a little bit more. And also, people can tell you whether or not somebody else has gone there already and whether mm -hmm. you're you know turning over you know well-worn ground so workshop has been important but also years ago i was in spain with david sedaris of all people and he had said never when you're on book tour never read from the current thing always read from the next thing 
because in a way you're always when you're on tour you are kind of opening a new show out of town and you are working on finding out where the laughs are you're looking on where you need a longer pause and where you need a little something extra where you need to sort of wait for something or flesh out something and so book tour was always a way of kind of road testing the next thing in front of a live audience to see how it would work, whether people would even engage with it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so workshop and book tour have always been the two primary ways of kind of testing an effect. Have you ever been reading something on tour and just been, and just packed it in? It just wasn't going? <laughs> You know, if the story doesn't work, the whole tour is fucked. Yes. If the story doesn't work, it doesn't matter how many prizes you've got or how clever you are in the Q&A. If the story doesn't work, you're dead. And so uh, I always just try to make sure that there's a great story. And I had a story named Love Nest when you're on tour. And it was about these people. The, uh, the wife thinks the husband is having an affair with his best friend, because these two men have rented a house in a really bad part of town secretly. And they've kind of stocked it with these kind of expensive looking things. And she actually breaks in and she catches them in bed together, pretending to sleep, and they almost kill her. And the reveal is that they're actually kind of setting a trap for burglars to break in and try to steal things so that they can kill them. They can justifiably murder them in the, in the act of, uh, you know, uh, stand your ground laws. And the happy ending was in the end, the husband and wife are laying in the bed of a rented house filled with stealable stuff and they're waiting to kill someone and they actually kill someone. And it renews their marriage, their love for each other, this kind of mutual murdering of a burglar. And that story did not work. And I was stuck reading that story through 11, 12 cities. And Wait, you didn't uh, have a backup plan? You know, my backup plan is guts. Guts always <laughs> works. Right. It's a little machine that always works. But now people are kind of ready for it. And half the time, 30% of the audience will just get up and walk out at the beginning. Yeah, so, make me faint, writer man. Yeah. So it's all the story has always got to be completely engaging and it's got to work. Yeah. Um, and do you still have a workshop you work with like before you take a story public? You know, uh, COVID has kind of uh, wrapped up the workshop. So, mm, yeah. Fair enough. Um, so one of the things, so just listening to you talk about that love nest story, um, and this is something I wrestle with a lot. So I don't mean it to sound like, hey, what's your problem? Because I think it's everyone's problem who does things like this for a living. So it's so not easy, but it feels so much more natural to write about unhappiness and violence and misery and pain. Because the second you start writing a character who's happy, they come across like an idiot. And I feel like the reader starts to think this guy's a, this, this, this character is a simpleton. Why is it so hard? I mean, I think most of us spend our lives either happy or tolerably existing where the, the misery are spikes throughout, you know, or maybe I'm just deluded or on the right meds that finally got adjusted. I don't know, but why is it so much easier to write about unhappiness than happiness? Couple things. Uh, number one, if you were happy, you would not be reading a book. You know, reading is, <laughs> is, is the default we go to when we are alone or we're, we're in a kind of stasis like an airport or an airplane, uh, kind of imposed isolation. And that's why you know, there's a kind of comfort when you're alone in reading about a, a character who is alienated or alone and who finds community in a new way, because ultimately, you want to find community in a book. And according to the anthropologist Shirley Bryce Heath, a book becomes a classic when it creates a community around it, like the Tolkien books, when people have to go to each other to kind of share their experience. And they have to encourage each other to read this book so they can talk about it. So number one, 
reading is a solitary pursuit. You are going into that book all alone and more probably not thrilled to be alone. Um, yeah. And uh, number two, you want to give people a kind of faux experience, a kind of faux sense of having lived through something. I think that's that's what any narrative does. And so unless there is a kind of, you know, meeting of a challenge, overcoming some sort of a, you know, unhappiness, then there's there's no sense of sort of triumph or survival. And ideally, I think that the best book takes the reader's worst fear and makes it real and then demonstrates someone living beyond the reader's worst case scenario. And there are a lot of studies that were done by the military that show that what women fear most is extreme pain, is physical pain. But what men fear most is humiliation and loss of social status and that kind of imposed shaming. And so, so many of my books, you know, beginning with Fight Club, the lowest point is not the point where you're getting beaten to a pulp. The lowest point is when you are publicly exposed as faking your cancer so that you are placed lower than every, everyone else present. Because I think for male readers, that is the worst case scenario. And you wanna show someone a character living through that moment and coming out the other side and not being destroyed by it. So that is, you know, the other thing you want to, the other reason why unhappiness has to happen in a narrative. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting when you're talking about shame. Yeah. I've seen those studies. It's, um, they're really fascinating. And I don't know if you've read Ann River Siddons, The House Next Door. No. Go on, please. Well, no, I was just going to say it does a really amazing thing, which is it's a haunted house book. And um, she's best known for her sort of Southern women's Oh, that's women's the book novels. from the yeah. 70s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, a classic. Yeah. Oh, that's a which great is, book. And the thing that's so good about it, I feel like, is her haunted house, it's not blood or flies or a voice saying, get out, priest. It's shame. It finds what people are ashamed of about themselves and, or hard, and, and it exposes it. And it's so, it's such a great savage idea. Would you say that again? Because I think that is a really undiscovered, largely unknown book right now. It's been oh, kind of forgotten. Sure. Yeah, Ann River Siddons, The House Next Door. She just passed away last year, I think. Um, and it's her only horror novel. There's a couple of writers who are really interesting. You've only ever written one horror novel and it's, you know, a classic. I don't know if you know Diane Johnson. She no. mostly writes sort of waspy society literary fiction, you know, with women living in LA and dealing with their marriages and their lives and all this. I'm making all these patronizing head movements. I, I don't know why. I'm just a, a sexist asshole. But they, they're very literary fiction kind of stuff. And she wrote this book called The Shadow Knows that's about a divorced mom who's being terrorized by obscene phone callers. I think it's from the late uh, mid 70s. And she she says, you know, this person calling me is going to kill me. I know in the next month they will murder me. And it is an amazing, amazing book. And actually Stanley Kubrick read it and then hired her to write the screenplay with them of The Shining because it's, a, but it's the only horror novel she ever wrote. And there are a few people like this where they just turn out a classic and then they're like, I'm done with that. Go <laughs> on to something else. Uh, Paul Manusco, who wrote Burnt Offerings, right. another fantastic haunted house horror book yeah uh, from the 70s uh he wrote the one book and that was it yeah did you ever read his play uh child's play no but that was kind of based on his teaching in a in a private school right yeah I, I i assume so man it is wild it's basically like teachers in a boys boarding school and it's all damp and corduroy and you can smell sort of the like you know the unwashed socks but the boys don't speak in the whole thing. They just sort of lurk and stare at people and you know, drive teachers crazy by staring at them. And you feel like he must have had a deeply unhappy teaching experience. <laughs> and it was like a Broadway hit. You know, now a Broadway hit play is like, you know, it's Hamilton, uh, where everyone sings and dances. And in the 70s, I guess you could have a play about disturbing boys' schools where they just stare at people and teachers scream at each other in the break room. It's a hit. You know, it's funny. Uh, there's a couple things that really don't age very well. Humor 
never ages very well. Mm. Uh, you, you read Thurber now, and Thurber's not very funny. And, yeah. you know, I adore Fran Lebowitz. She's kind of my, my negative hero. But her stuff does not age very well. It's really, yeah, it's really that, politically wrong. Yeah. Uh, you, that, you couldn't laugh yeah, at go it. Ahead. You, well, uh, that, it's something about that arch voice, right? It kind of curdles into elitism with history. Yeah. yeah. And horror ages a little bit better, but horror also really doesn't carry a lot of, it doesn't carry through time very effectively. Uh, yeah, very rarely does. Yeah. Well, it's weird. I mean, it's, you know, it's funny. You look at someone like Shirley Jackson, and she's got that, that just, dead sharp, very chilly voice, you know, that very precise style. And every sentence just shines. And she applies that to horror. It's great. She applies it to comedy, like in her um, Raising Demons and Life Among the Savages or some of her short stories. It works. It's just, you know, she's one of those people who you just wish she'd had a better marriage or and had lived longer. Um, uh, you know, I think that if, if there had been the happiness there, there wouldn't be the great work there. Uh, right. I, I don't think- happy, oh, I hate happy that people, formula though. I know, but you know, happy people don't need catharsis like that. They don't need to sit alone and, and put it on the page like that. Oh. But it's sort of, you know, writers, I guess, are sort of, I guess, in the Venn diagram between unhappiness and um, being high performance. Because if you get too unhappy, you're just going to sit there and watch Netflix. Uh, you you got to you got to be unhappy enough that it hasn't canceled out your your desire to sit down and share your misery. You know, you just uh, paraphrased uh, Joy Williams. Uh, Joy Williams is one of these sort of minimalist contemporary literary fiction writers that I love. I love, but Joy Williams always said to be a writer, you've got to be smart enough to come up with the idea. And then you've got to be stupid enough to actually execute it and go through that long, laborious process of writing and rewriting and keyboarding and editing and doing that long slog to actually make it something. And 99% of the world, they will come to you and they will say, I've got this fantastic idea for a book. Oh, yeah. And I want you to write it. Everyone's got all these great ideas, but nobody is dumb enough to actually sit down and slog through that horrible task. Yeah, well, so let me ask you, because I know we're going to take some questions real quick, but I wanted to ask you, what is something that you are just not capable of that you see other writers doing that you're like, God, you know, it would be a sweet life if I could do that. Like I, you look at some writers who wrote one and done, you know, to kill a mockingbird, I'm out. Like, you know, that always looks so appealing to me, but unfortunately I just keep disgorging these things like, like vomit. You know, I, I would argue that 90% of books are, are comfort writing, that people read them to fall asleep at night. And they want that big fat book that they can pick up every night the way that I pick up 10 or 12 Ambien and they can take it and it will put them to sleep. And I wish I could write a big Thomas Kincaid painting of light comfort right. book that people will pick up for the rest of their lives and they will read it and they will read it and they will read it and it does nothing but put them to sleep. Um, I wish I could write one of those books, but no, I've got to write something horrible every time. And I think a lot of that comes from my salad days when I came of age with the punk rock days where things had to be very confrontive and they really had to push the limits and they had to really offend somebody before they were considered successful. And so I don't feel like I've done my job unless I really feel like I've gone too far. I've taken, oh, there's a line in, uh, what is the new book, Invention of Sound. I read that. that everyone asked me to take this line out and it's really early in the book and every single reader, every editor, and my agent said, you can't put that line in there. That line has got to come out. That's too much. And that's exactly why that line had to stay in there. Because that's the line that crosses the line. And unless that's in there, I don't feel like I've done my job. And I don't want to, I don't want to be the old person dying and thinking, why didn't I put that line in there? Why was I such a chicken shit 
that it took out literally the only challenging big, big line. And I just don't want to reach the end of my life and think, I, I didn't do everything I could, could conceive of because I was afraid of going too far. Um, sorry. No, 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 it makes sense. I mean, you know, it's it's the Schindler moment, right? You're there on your deathbed going, I could have offended one more person, one more. <laughs> could have just done one more. <laughs> um, Lane, did you were you gonna throw a question in? Yeah, so um, I think we'll start. Thank you so much both for the fantastic conversation. I'm, I was so reluctant to pop back on screen to continue to listen to this. Um, well, you've ruined the mood, night, so you may as well throw a question. I know. <laughs> um, so that uh, previous comment actually segues pretty well into um, a question that somebody submitted beforehand um, through Instagram. Um, Chuck, every book you've written is so unlike anything I've ever read. Do you ever get story ideas that you throw out because you do some research and realize that someone else has already done it or something like it? Or do you just pursue every story idea you have and see how it takes shape? Or do you specifically set out to come up with a new way to tell the story that hasn't been done before? You know, I, I get some ideas that when I uh, kind of test them like Love Nest, they just don't land. The story does not land no matter how hard I try to unpack it or how hard I try to particularize it, make it real. Uh, recently, in one of our last workshops, we were talking about a magazine store, a used magazine store that was going out of business. And someone remarked that, that all these guys coming in with their lifetime collections of Playboy would no longer have a place to sell them. And someone in the workshop said, I wonder if that's how the big box of porn in the woods happens. And we all said, what do you mean? And he said, everyone as a child has found a big box of porn in a wild wooded setting. And in that workshop where I had maybe 20 students from the ages of 18 to their 60s, everyone at that table said, I thought it was just me. Everyone had found a box, a satchel, a duffel bag, a garbage bag of porn in a tree, under a dumpster, in the woods, in the desert, at the beach. And they'd all discovered this at a really inappropriate age. And they all had lived with the kind of repercussions of it until that moment. And then they all leaned forward at that table and they all wanted to tell their box of porn in the woods story at the same time. So part of deciding which story to pursue is finding out whether everyone has that experience. And with uh, Invention of Sound, when I started talking about the commodification of human screams, a friend of mine said, have you heard of the Wilhelm scream, which is a classic scream that's used in thousands of TV shows and videos and movies, and it's become kind of this institutional joke that now has to be used. And the Howie Long scream and the, the goofy yodel and all these commodified classic screams that have been around for, for decades and decades. And the fact that I could throw out a, an idea and other people would relate to it and would unpack it from what they knew, that's always the indication of that's the idea to pursue. That's the thing to turn into you know, a 200, 300 page book. Box of Porn in the Woods. And we were, we were gonna write an anthology, the workshop, and we were gonna call it Children of the Porn. But when we pitched that to publishers, all the publishers said, that is a book that bans itself, okay? Children and porn in the title is just not gonna sell. Yeah. Um, another question that was submitted um, earlier today, um, you've both written and worked across film, comics, books, podcasts, and Chuck, um, I know you've spoken about your love of spoken word storytelling before. Um, could you both speak some, maybe less about the form of storytelling, but more about how you see the spirit of storytelling translate across and through these different mediums? And if you think of one medium, uh, the, the strengths of one medium over another to convey uh, like horror and cringe. You want to take that, Grady? 
Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I was just gonna say, I mean, for me, I really like doing screenplay work and book work kind of at the same time or close together because movies are so relentlessly exterior. Mm -hmm. I mean, if it's not dialogue or action, who cares, man? Um, and they're so efficient, like really efficient. Like you, you, you've got a prop. I want to see that four times. That letter, I want to see that three times and it's got to pay off. Um, and, and writing screenplays made me realize how sloppy so many books are. People driving around in cars talking the fuck wants to see that like you know like it just you know I look at horror store which was my first sort of in the, in the solo novel and even though it takes place in one location I managed to have someone in a car by themselves going somewhere like four times like now in a book if I've got someone in a car there's someone in the car with them they're arguing something's going on and so, there's some emotional thing they don't want to go where they're going they're they're really excited there's got to be something because people walk it down halls no one cares um but then books are so interior you know it's um we were saying earlier so much of invention of sound is someone listening um and i didn't even notice that till i got to the end because i got so caught up in it but i was like jesus so much of this book is someone sitting there with some cans on their ears listening really hard. Um, you look at Rebecca, the Daphne du Maurier book. I have a life and a marriage, so I don't have the time to do this, but someone should do this, which is go through and like count up how much of that book is the narrator imagining conversations, imagining what's going to happen to her, imagining something. So much of that book is her just thinking about embarrassing things. She doesn't even get embarrassed. She just thinks about getting embarrassed for pain, but it's gripping. So for me, that's the big difference. And they really do play off of each other because I can't tell you how many screenplays I've read where the writer just doesn't have a life for that character off the page. Um, you can just tell they came in cold. This is my hero, 30s, tough guy, ex-Navy SEAL. And that's all they've done. They haven't done that interior work off the page. And how many novels I've read where, where, where there's nothing happening on the page. It's just all relentlessly interior in a kind of half-baked way so i don't know i don't know how you feel Chuck. you know i won't name names but i just finished reading a friend's novel that was enormous cascading chapters of dialogue where they were all always saying huge expository things that told the backstory well you know when i had you i was only 14 years old and my father had had his way with me and i was very damaged at the time and you know i had a drinking problem and You've got to forgive me for that. And I, I drank a great deal and, and I fought with your father. And, and it's just informing this long backstory that we really don't need that, uh, that is kind of the work of the actor, that the actor has to come up with a way of presenting that backstory in every gesture and every kind of sort of physical way so that even if it's subconsciously we understand the tension that's happening there and and most writers just don't sort of have a way of presenting that that kind of physical presence of the past and so you have to keep the past present in everything that the narrator is doing and you have to think through how does every moment occur as an extension of this character's past. And so that's why the old you know, Ursula Le Guin advice of everybody walks into a different room. A painter does not walk into the same room that a plumber walks into. That everything, the presence of everything is framed through that character's experience. And you don't want to dictate what that experience is, but you want to pre constantly present the present as as perceived through that experience, blah, blah, blah. Awesome. Um, and another question for both of you, what do you think is the literary equivalent to a jump scare? Unless it's a pop-up book, it seems as though the same effect can't really be produced by a book. You wanna go? I can go. No, yo, go for it. You know, there are these moments of complete authority in fiction in, uh, and I wouldn't call it a jump scare. I would call it a, oh my God, I can't believe he went there. I can't believe she went there. 
that moment in the Jesus's son, the Dennis Johnson uh, short story collection, uh, there's a short story called Dirty Wedding, where uh, uh, the, the, the main character, uh, Fuckhead, is, takes his girlfriend, Michelle, in for an abortion. And he's waiting in the waiting room while Michelle's having the abortion. And the nurse comes to him and says, uh, Michelle is comfortable now. She's fine. And Fuckhead says, is she dead? And the nurse gets very flustered and says, no, she's not dead. Why would you even say that? And Fuckhead says, I kind of wish she was. And the scene devolves to chaos. The nurse calls security. The, the guy is thrown out. The anti-abortion protesters pelt him with eggs. But that moment when he says the fantastically brutal, honest thing, I kind of wish my girlfriend was dead. That is so fantastically honest and brutal and authentic that I fell in love with Dennis Johnson. I thought I will read Dennis Johnson for the rest of my life because of that moment. And that moment when the writer puts something on the page that uh, is so honest, but also so risky, uh, that gains my complete admiration. That's what I would consider the, the equivalent of a jump scare. Yeah, I feel like with, you're dealing with such different technologies, right? Like movies have all this stuff. Books are just weird marks on dead trees that you're supposed to decode inside your heads quietly. Um, so, so there's something some things just can't do, but I kind of feel like, I don't know. I don't know what the value of a jump scare is. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not quite sure, but I know that for me, because I'm a bit of a hack, I feel like the end of every chapter has to have that hook sentence that gets people to the next chapter or makes them feel compelled to go there. Um, you just have to. I mean, otherwise, why is someone gonna keep reading? I mean, all, I feel like all writing is, is directing and focusing the audience's or the reader's attention. I mean, that's it. We have a bunch of different tricks to do it, but we're just trying to direct your attention. Um, and so I feel like that end of the chapter line, that sentence and the beginning of the next chapter sentence, they gotta land, they gotta land. I mean. I'm doing rewrites on a book that I just wrapped up today. In this book, I just looked, the first draft of this fucking thing was 2014. And I sent it off to my editor and I just realized I've got to go in again and fix three chapters, first line. They just have gotten, they've gotten so copy edited, they've gotten screwed up and they don't land anymore. Um, and they may not still land after I'm done with them, but I will meddle them to death. Um, so I feel like for me, that's, the thing that's like a jump scare, because a jump scare is just supposed to keep the audience engaged. It's a, it's a cheap adrenaline shot in case they're falling asleep. And for me, that's that last sentence, first sentence. Yeah, in, I, in, I think that's a valid idea. In comics, you always have that page turn reveal. The page turn, yeah. Yeah, which can be a, a, a mechanical jump scare. Did you actually just, sorry, I'm not trying to talk out of school, but did you like writing comics? I find them such a weird bastard medium, sort of halfway between both. I find them really tough. I liked it. I, I love a challenge. I love the fact that they have to be plotted so intensely that you have to have a setup and a payoff every two pages. And uh, you have to kind of play to a different, the strengths of a different medium. You can have a splash page where you want people to linger for 45 minutes to try to see everything on that page, uh, that you're you're given that level of description, you know, in effect description, that I feel like I can't really risk in a novel because too much description in a novel puts this into a long passive phase of boredom. Right. Uh, where you can have that really elaborate detail on a splash page and, and still get away with it. So well, I just appreciate the strengths. Yeah, I'm actually curious, like, do you, does description make you nervous? Because I feel like people are such lazy observers. I mean, I know I am in real life. Like I often worry about description because I feel like most people walk into a room and just, they get the lead, they get the headline and then they like just proceed with whatever they're doing. 
You know, um, I'm kind of of the school, the, unless it changes size and shape against my retina, it disappears. Uh, I think the way that animals perceive the world, that unless it's moving, it doesn't exist. And the way that you disappear is that you just freeze. And that if you depict too many things in a static series of description, this was here, this was here, she had red hair, these things aren't moving, they're just existing, then they disappear. They don't occur in that animal way. That for things to occur, they have to be changing size and shape against the reader's mental retina. They have to be taking an action in some way. And so I will do description, but it's only in terms of something moving through the environment. Um, this is another question. It's a little long, so bear with me, but I think it, it will um, bring up some interesting conversation, particularly in relation to um, like genre and horror. So um, Grady, about four years ago, you wrote an article for Tor titled Beloved, the best horror novel the horror genre has never claimed. And in that article, you said, quote, making experience visceral and immediate is not considered the territory of horror anymore unless you're describing over the top violence. Writing to convey the immediacy of the felt experience is considered the purview of literary fiction, often dismissed as stories where nothing happens because their author isn't focused on plot, but on the, on the felt experience of her characters. Horror has doubled down on its status as a genre, and that kind of writing isn't considered genre appropriate. It's the same reason Chuck Palahniuk isn't considered a horror writer, even though he writes about ghosts, witchcraft, body horror, and gore. Do you all have thoughts on this? Um, well, I will say I sounded a lot smarter back then. I've lost brain cells since then. Um, but I do think that, you know, the two great horror novels of the 20th century, I think, I mean, there's not much argument really, objectively speaking. I mean, it's Shirley Jackson's Haunting of Hill House and it's Toni Morrison's Beloved. Um, it is literally a book that starts with a haunted house and a possession. And I don't know why horror genre hasn't owned that the way sci-fi has owned, say, The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood. Like, if you don't, if you were a smarty pants, but you want to read some of this, surprise, it's in our genre and there's more here like it. Um, it it's weird to me because I think, I mean, Beloved is a horror novel. It deals with ghosts right up front. Um, genre is tough because it's a marketing category more than anything else, really. Um, but yeah, I do feel a little prickly about that. Boy, you know, it's, uh, it's tough because you could almost argue that Wuthering Heights is a horror novel. Oh, I think it, it is. It's gothic horror. Yeah. Um, with a very long backstory. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, the good ghost the, scenes in the first chapter. <laughs> the... Uh, where it should be, you know, you really want to drag somebody into the story. There was a fantastic book and it's, it's a pile of, of, what's the phrase, a little pile of wood, pile of wood to saw through. Uh, Patrick McGurl's book, The Program Era, which is a long history. It came out, I think, I believe, through Princeton Press. Oh, long history of the of the, the MFA, the writing program yes. in 20th century America. And among many intelligent things he proposes is that literary fiction has become completely standardized in the 20th century. That it has to be either uh, techno-modernism, which is Pynchon, which is David Foster Wallace, which is Gaddis, which is kind of metafiction that's hyper aware of itself and hyper aware of using literary conventions in a kind of self-aware, ironic way, or it is uh, high cultural pluralism, which is any kind of marginal marginalized point of view, which is Joy Luck Club, which is, you know, Beloved, which is uh, uh, Cisnero, Sandra Cisneros, which is Juno Diaz, uh, which is Sherman Alexie, that it's got to be literary fiction, but told from a very specifically outsider uh, sexuality or outsider racial identity. Or the third category is dirty realism, or what they call Kmart realism, which is Raymond Carver, which is Joyce Carol Oates, 
which is characters for whom uh, economic status is their primary concern. They're trying to move up from poverty and they're always tenuously kind of in the middle class. And I would argue that to some extent, horror has kind of fallen into that same trap. McGurl says that literary fiction had to become standardized so that it could be graded, so that professors mm -hmm. could assign letter grades to whatever their students were doing for $80,000 a year in graduate programs. And David Foster Wallace makes that same point in a great essay that he wrote about uh, MFA programs, that unless you can standardize literary fiction, you don't know who's an A or who's a B. And I'm a little afraid that horror is getting very standardized in that same way, that unless it really cleaves to a very specific stereotype or very specific sort of series of symbols, it's not considered horror anymore, or it's not mm -hmm. considered good horror. That right. unless it's really based on a precedent, we don't identify it as such. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, I never did an MFA, per, I don't know, did you? No, oh, yeah, my God. who has that money? <laughs> yeah, um, but uh, I, just did, I just did three years of audio engineering, uh, learning how to cut reel-to-reel -reel tape, because uh, that's so useful. Um, but uh, one of the things I think is a big problem with horror is the meta nature of so much of it. I think once a body of literature, and I hate that word because it always seems to come with a capital L, has a history, people want to tip their hat to it. And I just think that's death. There is nothing that pulls me out of a story faster. It's like that scene in a movie where a director thinks they're clever and like there's two bumbling cops named Officer Romero and Officer Argento. You know, D D Detective Cronenberg, it's like, oh, for fuck's sake. Um, or and Lovecraft then, dropped yeah. into something, the Lovecraft <laughs> Institute. We, we got, yes, exactly. Uh, I, you're gonna go, we, we got this book from Miskatonic Library. Like, oh, fuck you. Um, but I do also find that, um, so then I think that kind of meta nature of it is a drag. And I find that when things, there starts being this boundary drawing, what is, what isn't, becomes a real bummer to me because it just rules stuff out. Um, you know, but I also think part of the problem and I think it's a publishing problem, I don't think it's a genre problem, mm -hmm. is there's just not enough water in the pool. I mean, you look at the 70s and 80s, even into the early 90s, when you had a paperback original, mid-list author could sell 80,000 copies, 90,000 copies, you know? And people had bigger lines, there were more readers, there were more distribution channels. You've got a paperback at a bus stop or a grocery store or what have you, the book of the month club. And I think that there was more of, you know, Diane Johnson's Shadow Nose is sold with horror on the side. It's literary fiction, you know? I mean, you look at a lot of these authors and that's selling right next to someone like William Johnstone's Toy Cemetery about, you know, apple-headed products of incest terrorizing a small town ruled by Satan. And, <laughs> and the genre is so expansive that it covers both those things because there's enough readers where both those authors get paid. And I feel like now there's so little water in the pool that everything that comes out gets really scrutinized. What is this? What's the genre? How do we appeal to those fans? How do we get that core audience? And it's a marketing problem, but I feel like it does start to affect writing at a certain point. And I, no, I totally agree because, uh, you know, the, the uh, manuscript goes to acquisition, acquisitions board and the marketing people say, okay, what's the niche? What shelf does mm -hmm. this go on? And yeah. unless you've got a ready-made shelf and a ready-made kind of identity, it can be sold in relation to existing things. You know, my, my editor years ago told me, if you want to succeed, you write me the Chicano Joy Luck Club. That's what the market is looking for. And I can't write the Chicano Joy Luck Club it's just not me, um, but everything is kind of defined by what's already succeeded. So I agree, yeah. I agree. Yeah, and also one of the things that's, in, that's weird to me is so many of the books I love, 
you look at them this way, you know, it's kind of like, you know, is this two white faces kissing or is it a black goblet, you know, depending on how you let your field of vision shift. It's like, I love, I think Charles Portis's True Grit is the great 20th century American novel period, full stop. I will fight people over that. It's a pandemic, we'll have to do it with words. But squint this way, it's a Western. Squint that way, it's literary fiction. Um, and so many of the books I love have that genre of, thing to them because I guess I'm a simpleton and I really like a story. You know, I really like external movement. Well, and think about the James Whale Universal Horror Films. They were so campy and people, you either laughed at them or you were terrified by them. And so having that undecidability is very Derrida. It's very wonderful. Mm -hmm. And it's, is a zombie alive? Is a zombie dead? And the fact right. that it can't be resolved one way or the other is what keeps it alive. Yeah. Well, and that's, you know, is it this, is it that is a really spooky aspect to writing. There is nothing creepier than reading a book by, to me, by a dead author. And like knowing the writing process from the inside out where I sit here and I trick myself into having feelings in this stinky little room you see. And then I try to encode that into these symbols on paper and then you buy it and hopefully you unpack those symbols and you have that experience I was making myself feel like I was having. When you're doing that with a dead author, that's messed up. Like you start thinking about that too hard and you start questioning what's going on in your head. I'm, th I'm like that when I watch porn and I know that the actor or the actress is dead. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I can totally see that. That's not yeah. good, that's not healthy. Ghost <laughs> orgasms. Well, um, and you know, it's weird. Can I just, just on the topic of ghost orgasms, I was mentioning this to a few people lately and they were really looking at me like I was crazy. Everyone remembers Ghostbusters, right? Like a fun movie, like uh, yeah. Dan Aykroyd gets a blowjob from a ghost in the middle of that movie. Doesn't get talked about that. It, yeah. Like, this is for kids? He has necrophilia <laughs> in this movie. Like it's, <laughs> it is a necrophiliac kid film. It's bizarre. If we're gonna go there, okay. Please. Today, on the radio, I keep hearing these reports about human sex trafficking. And I'm like, okay, what other, what other kind of sex trafficking is there? If we have to put human on the front end, that means that there's other kinds. So, Oh yeah. What else is going on that I don't know about? What are we not paying attention to? So well, I'll tell you right now, because then you will know about it. Um, when, I, when I lived in <laughs> Hong Kong in the 90s, there was a big article in the local paper because animal rights workers had rescued an orangutan from a bordello for truck drivers um, in India. Because Hong Kong loves news stories about other Asian countries that are doing something disgusting to be like, that would never happen in Hong Kong. Look at these filthy people. Um, but they kept this orangutan shaved. They had a picture of her in a dress. They kept her shaved and they kept her in a dress and they kept her in a dark room and the drivers weren't supposed to know she was a simian. Um, but it also said in there, some of them actually requested her. Oh my God. This oh. poor fucking ape. It was, it is awful. And now you have that to haunt yourself. If you kill yourself tonight or tomorrow, we'll all know why and understand. Goes back to the harming, harming animals in, in stories being, yeah. being too far. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, You've got I wanted, this, you, you crossed the line there. Yeah, I did. No, I feel like I really feel like I made a huge error in judgment just then. Can we all just rewind? There's like 85, 65 participants. Let's just take this back, all of us, yeah. and pretend we left it at Chuck's comment about human sex trafficking. Okay. Um, we do have time for about one or two more questions. And I did want to just comment also that as a bookseller, the idea of genre. Um, is, and, and as a marketing ploy is extremely frustrating and it keeps me uh, genuinely sometimes up at night worrying about somebody who's looking in the in the literature section missing something that's shelved in sci-fi even though I know that it would fit with what they're looking for or you know a horror book or whatever it's 
it's a nightmare. And I know that most booksellers agree and are extremely frustrated by it. And I wish that it weren't so. Um, I just did an event actually at a library where the children's librarians have just shelved everything alphabetical author uh, order by the author's last name, genre doesn't matter. And they actually said that they were getting great results. No one seemed to care. Maybe if I'm ever brave enough to do that and face all our customers. Um, oh, before I forget, Grady, are yeah. you aware of a book from the 70s? And I think it was called Let's Go Play at the Adams House. We Did just, you read that? So I just helped these guys bring it back into print and wrote the uh, intro for it. Did you, have you read it? Uh, please, would you cover this? Oh, <laughs> Jesus, um, you're, you're merciless. Um, Let's Go Play the Adams is written by this guy, Mendel Johnson, who was um, a reporter and a boat salesman in Maryland. And it's basically, um, uh, it's basically, it's, it's ostensibly based on the Sylvia Likens incident, um, which was a murder torture thing from the Midwest in the 50s, where basically uh, a girl was sent to live with a neighbor while I think her parents were out of town and got tortured to death by the parents of the house and the neighborhood children. She just became this neighborhood game um, until she died. And Jack Ketchum wrote a book about it called, um, oh crap, I can't remember the title. Um, anyways, and then Mendel Johnson wrote this book called Let's Go Play at the Adams. And it's a nice waspy neighborhood in Maryland, suburbs, a babysitter's there. The parents are in Europe for two weeks. Babysitter takes care of the kids and she wakes up and the kids have tied her to a bed. And they've decided they're going to play a game with her. And it can only end in one place. And I would, I read this book once. Um, I'm very, very happy I read it. I never want to read it again. But it does. Have you read it, Chuck? How old were you when you read it? Oh, just like five years ago. Okay. I was 11, 10 or 11 when I read it. Wow. What, do you remember the cover at all? Which cover it was? Is it the one with I, the babysitter seen through the door who's like bound and gagged, like a photo cover? No, remember. I don't remember it. I just, I read it at a pre-sexual age. Okay. So I was identifying with the very young children who were confronted by the corporeal, corporealness of this naked tied down woman. And they were so put off by the physicality of a naked person. Uh, and it came through our mail order library because I lived on a farm. And so it came in the mail as a book that I just happened to order uh, oh, wow. at 10 years old. Well, it's a great uh, title. Yeah, it was completely inappropriate. But at the time it was being sold as a true story. And I didn't realize mm -hmm. it was based on a true story. Yeah. So wait, so what did you think of it? Like, I, I was horrified by ultimately the way in which they killed her and that kind of frenzy yeah. of violence. I thought it was um, far more disturbing than Lord of the Flies or anything oh, yeah. else that was available to us. Uh, and it was kind of like finding that box of porn in the woods. It was something I couldn't take to my parents. I was just really deeply troubled by and had to just kind of compartmentalize, pretend I'd never seen, uh, and send back to the library. Uh -oh. Yeah. Well, you know, it's an interesting book. I never want to read again, but it does have one of the most beautiful final chapters I've ever read, which is sort of like her point of view, this psychedelic chapter as she, you know, dies. I mean, someone just said spoiler alerts in chat. It's a book from the mm -hmm. 70s. And I will say, from the first page, you know, there's one place this book is going, and you hope it doesn't go there, and it does. Um, but it's this really beautiful sort of subjective experience of dying. And it features one of the most beautiful lines I've ever read in a book anywhere, where she says, goodness, go out of the world. It's just this beautiful, beautiful moment. It's, but it's an absolutely horrifying book. I mean, <laughs> you know, and I think in a way, uh, forgive me, but that's kind of an, uh, an ideal that I always try to go towards is it doesn't matter how profane gets, things get. Uh, in a way, the profane is a way to arrive at, at a place of genuine kind of profound uh, sacredness. Just one moment of really genuine, not sentimentality, but really genuine human feeling. Uh, and if it takes slogging through, you know, a septic tank to get there, uh, if it's earned, then I think you get it. 
Uh, so you know, maybe it well, was yeah, on. but but I think everyone's sort of craving that connection with something bigger than themselves, with the shared human experience, with something extra, whatever it is. And I think extreme experience, whether it's good or bad, gets you there. You know, um, extreme pleasure, extreme pain. Um, you know, and it also forces you into community because you can't assimilate, you can't process it by yourself. You have to take it to other people and say, this happened to me, will you also experience it so that we can discuss it, so we can process it together. So it returns you to community afterwards. Well, I notice in your books, actually, there's a, there are a lot of group therapy sessions or therapy, you know, these people sitting around processing a trauma which is a kind of storytelling, but it's a really, it's an intimate, it's a kind of storytelling in which bullshitting isn't encouraged and honesty is. Well, I'm always looking for a context in which a story is being told because that's one of the, the big tenets of minimalism is you can't just tell a story because we don't trust a story as being uh, objective anymore. We need to know the context, who's telling it and why are they telling it and where are they telling it? And so, in so many narratives, you have that kind of objective uh, expository context. Again, think of the movie Clute, where mm -hmm. occasionally Jane Fonda lays down on an analyst's couch yeah. and she says, I don't know why I love him and I, I hate him and I'm not gonna go away with him at the end. But then visually we see her going away with him and she's got luggage. So it counteracts what she's actually telling the therapist. And it's that disconnect that is so wonderfully heartbreaking and moving at the end of that movie. So, so many narratives like uh, Sex in the City, Carrie Bradshaw is always at that laptop in those expository yeah. transitions saying, what is it with three ways? Am I the only one in New York not doing three ways right now? And so she's constantly, we have that expository way of making the theme uh, you know, overt before we demonstrate it dramatically. Um, and so I think support groups, therapy groups, recovery groups are a way that people have that is a new religion, a way that they have of coming together and processing the way that they used to do through Catholic mass or confession or communion. So in, mm. a, in a way, they're the new narrative form of communion. Yeah. Um, well, I think and then, Go ahead, Grady. No, I was going to say, Chuck, you wanted to read something, didn't you? <laughs> I'm sorry. I realized we got totally I've carried that, away. Yep. <laughs> I, I, I got a, a story. It's a, it's six pages. It's in the, the, the current cemetery dance. Uh, and if you don't mind, I was going to read it. I was going to turn off Please. the overhead light, though. So Do it. give me a second. Sure. Yeah. I figure pe people either checked out at the orangutan or they're still here. And yeah, they're, they're, they're in. Yeah. <laughs> what a wild story. Yeah. We didn't tell it. There was no story. Didn't happen. So uh, the story is called The Prophecy of Ruth. <sighs> Ruth squatted down and pulled at the bottom drawer. The white paint had worn off the knobs and the old wood felt smoother than paint, polished, polished slippery by bare skin, oiled by the oil off so many fingers. Ruth pulled and the wood barked. She pulled and tumbled backwards on the thin rug. A knob had ripped free showing a, a metal screw still sunk in the front of the drawer. She tossed the loose knob aside and rose to her knees. The drawer had come open a smidgen, so she wedged her fingertips into the crack and dragged it out. One side budged, and then the other, until the drawer moaned. It slid open with a smell of paperback books found in the baking hot attic on a summer day. She saw a mouse nest first, a blizzard of black specks darted and swam over the shreds of paper, and Ruth snatched back her hands and looked and shook her fingers clean. 
the specs became mouse droppings, became sugar ants. But when she saw at last what they were, silverfish, there was nothing to see but, but the mouse nest. And even that wasn't a mouse nest, not anymore. It was just paper. The slips of paper filled the drawer. They filled it to the brim, folded slips of paper, hardly bigger than a fortune cookie, some with a ragged edge, some torn from yellow legal pads, and others were just white paper that had yellowed with age. Each was folded smaller and folded smaller, creased and pinched tight to make a little packet. Kneeling on the thin rug, Ruth pulled, picked one up. She held the, the packet at arm's length, no telling what might fall out, as she picked at one loose edge and she opened it. It looked blank until she turned it over. Someone had written the length of the paper in black ink. Penmanship in letters, as round and curling as, as pubic hair. Cursive, her father would call it. Her father's handwriting in black ballpoint pen. Vero, her father would call it. Ruth read, quote, November 1985, the furnace is making that noise again, unquote. She set the paper aside and she stuck her hand into the drawer for another. As if she were choosing in a lottery, she, drug, she dug around. Her hand swam through the folded papers, stirred them, tossed them like she would, would toss a salad. Her fingers closed around another paper and she lifted it. She shook it free of possible silverfish, opened it. In that same round handwriting, it read, quote, September 1982, Africanized honeybees will attack this state next summer, unquote. Killer bees, he meant. Ruth smiled to herself. She plunged her hand into the folds of paper and plucked out another. It read, quote, April 1988, Susan is coughing again, unquote. In that same hairy handwriting. This one hurt. He'd meant his wife. He'd written this three, maybe four years before she'd been diagnosed with cancer. If he'd done anything more than write this note and stash it away, Ruth's mother might be here right now, helping collect his things for charity. She chose another folded secret, quote, Benny Despondent, unquote, dated 1997. From killer bees to her brother's depression, it wasn't that her father hadn't worried about the wrong things. He hadn't worried about anything. Another slip read, quote, June 9th, 1977, Desmond found a lump on his testicle, unquote. Whoever Desmond had been, if he'd asked her dad for advice, Ruth guessed that Desmond was probably dead. Quote, March 1998, Benny says he's going to kill himself, unquote. Her father had written these words, folded them, and socked them away, like Scarlett O'Hara procrastinating her panic. Ruth plunged her hand back into this, this collection of her father's worst fears. She had Dale Carnegie to thank. Maybe, maybe Dale Carnegie didn't invent it, but he turned it into a thing. Her father had read Carnegie's book, how to Win Friends and Influence Strangers. He'd pressed Benny to read How to Stop Worrying and Start Living. In it, Dale Carnegie would write his worst fears on a slip of paper. He'd fold the paper and toss it into a drawer. Every year, he'd, he'd dump out the drawer and he'd read his accumulated fears, and Dale Carnegie would laugh over how none of them had ever come to pass. Around the time that Harpo Marx made a cameo appearance on I Love Lucy. Dale Carnegie had died from Hodgkin's. Ruth fished another worry out of the past. This one, quote, Ruthie says the Pontiac smells hot after she drives up Webster Hill, unquote. This one dated August 1979. The engine had never caught fire. The radiator, radiator hadn't boiled over. 
Her father had squirreled away her concern and nothing had ever come to pass. Kneeling on the rug, she plucked out other false alarms. She chose the harmonic con convergence of 1987. When all the planets in the solar system were supposed to align and their combined gravitational fields were, would devastate mankind, she unfolded notes about the Y2K doomsday bug of 1999, the Nibiru meteor of 1995, bird flu, SARS, the global cooling of 1972, peak oil, swine flu, the 2012 Mayan day of annihilation, acid rain, ozone depletion, the gypsy moth, Africanized honeybees. She read notes about 1974 satellite photos that showed the Arctic ice sheet advancing and a new ice age was imminent, collapsing frog populations. Her father and Dale Carnegie weren't alone. No less than Joan Didion had done this, Don't, Joan Didion, among the most famous writers of her generation. During the years that Didion had lived in a derelict mansion on Franklin Avenue in Los Angeles, in what she wrote had been a, quote, senseless killing neighborhood, unquote. Didion had written down the license plates of trucks that parked outside, trucks that circled the block, suspicious trucks. Didion wrote about the notes in her essay collection, The White Album. Joan Didion had put all these license numbers into a drawer for the police to find after she'd someday be murdered by a stranger. And no one had ever arrived to butcher Joan Didion. That summer, Death went to Sharon Tate's house instead. Ruth closed both eyes and she listened to the sounds of the house, the pop of a window frame warming in the sun. The wooden joint popped like her father's knuckles. The, the clock ticking at the foot of the stairs sounded, sounded the same as the metal parts when the oven in the kitchen heated up. She sunk both hands into the folded bits of paper. She scooped up years of fear. One cupped handful of terror she let spill down onto the other papers, rustling papers, papers cascading over papers, dread poured upon dread, all these days and years, a jumble. She chose another, quote, July 2017, Zika virus to destroy the next generation of children, unquote. She picked out, quote, June 1968, mercury and other heavy metals to wipe out all tuna stocks, unquote. Some papers her father had rolled tight like cigarettes. These had sunk to the bottom of the drawer. From among these, she unrolled, quote, May 1970, the pimple on my leg won't heal, unquote. Some notes, full pages, folded one way, then folded the other, so they unfolded like old roadmaps. Paper napkins folded down to the size of postage stamps, compressed, pressed, pinched, crushed so the worry would never escape. Here was her father as a young man and an old man, pecking away on a typewriter or scribbling with a pen. In this drawer, he lived every age at the same time. The terrible handwriting of his growing up, it surrendered to the terrible handwriting of his old age all his fears from monsters under the bed to West Nile virus. They were stockpiled here. Papers, like the little notes the kids palmed from hand to hand in grade school. Origami, with any loose edge tucked to stay closed, the dried ink stuck, stuck shut so long that the folds tore when her fingernails tried to pick them apart. Quote, Rosie, Rosie not eating her food again. July 1974, unquote. Rosie had been Ruth's long ago poodle. He'd written in May of 2018, quote, that boy at the supermarket asked if Ruthie is still married, unquote. On the surface, not a problem, unless her dad had left out some detail. But why take note of it if it hadn't been a, hadn't been a problem? Quote, boy at the market asked if Ruthie still lives in town. He drove past her house for a look. This was dated June of 2018. Ruth lay the strips of paper next to each other, organizing them by date, the oldest to the most recent. 
She put, quote, August 1978 is Trixie on her last legs, unquote, next to, quote, May 1982, the gypsy moth will destroy all North American hardwoods in the next five years, leading to catastrophic wildfires, unquote. Between them, she placed, quote, May 1979, acid rain to deforest the entire nation, unquote. Uh, Trixie had been her mom's sp split leaf philodendron. Ruth saw how the news media had dialed the panic, panic up and dialed it down year by year. She jigsaw puzzled notes together looking for a pattern or just to create a pattern just even because a fake understanding felt better than real chaos. Ruth tossed aside notes about the snow apocalypse of 1979. They piled up to make a white drift with the snowmageddon of 1998 and 1999 and 2003 and the snowzilla of 2005. She found, quote, September 2000, right upper rear molar feels loose. Then, quote, the boy at the supermarket says they went to school together. He says he wants to touch her hair when he bags Ruthie's vodka. He double bags without, without her asking, but she never says thanks, unquote. Also June of 2018, then, quote, boy not working at the supermarket, cashier won't say why, July 2018, unquote. Then, swine flew his back, then, Ruthie's cat went missing, August 2018. Ruth pulled the drawer free of the dresser. She knelt leaning over it, this open, this open wooden box brimming with her father. She could picture him revisiting his old terrors and chuckling over the horrors that had never come to pass, the meteors that hadn't annihilated the planet. After a lifetime of killer bees and acid rain, ozone holes and, and bird flu, why worry about the bag boy at the neighborhood price chopper? Being scared of everything had left her father afraid of nothing. She listened to the house settle around her, clouds that cut the sunlight. A wind rose as the sun began to go down. In the dim light, dimmer now, she could hardly read, quote, heard a new noise in the attic today, unquote. This one dated just before he'd been found, dated a day later, quote, mislaid the good butcher knife, unquote. Ruth stretched to reach the lamp atop the dresser. She turned on the light. The fears now lay on the rug in a circle all around her. Patterns emerged in the handwriting, little headlines, ozone depletion tied to terminal skin cancer and this phenol eight in plastics tied to testicular cancer, causal effect her father would call it. Unbalanced, possibly schizophrenic bag boy at the market tied to a missing cat, tied to noises in the attic, tied to, tied to her father found dead from an apparent fall down the basement stairs. Ruth smiled over how her father must have spooked himself, how he would have sat here gloating over the impending ice ages and the rising sea levels and the atom bombs and the sarin gas and the coronaviruses that had gone on to someone else's house instead. Her father had listened to the house tick, the clock in the hallway tick, and he'd cracked his knuckles to echo the window frames cooling in the sunset. And not the next earthquake or the next earthquake or the next would be the big one that tipped everything sideways and tumbled them all into the ocean. And Ruth felt his smug pride. She looked at the time on her, on her phone. If he were alive, her father would write, electromagnetic radiation from cell phones will kill us all. And today's date. The time was 8.32. It was later than she'd guessed. 
Among the last pages she opened, she read, quote, there is no God. We won't be reunited. Nothing comes after, unquote. This one dated the day that he had fallen, maybe. The medical examiner had been hard to pin down. Here would be her father's legacy to her. While other people had stampeded around, raving about genetically engineered corn and spontaneous hive collapse tied to crop failures and famine, her father had remained serene. He had not joined the chicken little and turkey lurky crowd and screamed about the sky always falling. The sky was not falling. Ruth listened to the sounds of her father's house, harmless sounds of the house settling around her. She was her father's child, a stoic. To embrace this fact brought her a calm, sweet certainty that she would never, ever lose her head. Among the last notes she read, another fear, quote, Ruthie will never appreciate how much I love her, unquote. She pressed the paper flat on the rug, kneeling there in the circle of light from the lamp. The words weren't written in her father's hairy cursive handwriting. These belonged to a stranger. And she looked at them for a long time until, until behind her, she heard the doorknob turn. She heard the hinges squeak and the bedroom door began to drift open. That's the prophecy of Ruth. So, nice story is that the one you're taking on the road for this tour there is no this tour well the the thing no I, i've got a whole i've got a I, I always have short stories going as little experiments to see if i can expand them into something bigger and uh and for an, a real in-person tour I would like to have the the equivalent of guts, a real something that either makes people weep. Uh, I wrote a story called Zombies. Oh yeah, uh, that the, made a lot of people weep. Defibrillator one, right? And to see guys in their twenties openly weeping at, on college campuses was really something. Uh, so guts and zombies were really good stories, and uh, facts of life story where the father's trying to explain to the son where babies come from. That works like a, a little, that's a little steam engine that always works. So yeah, this one is a campfire story. This one is yeah. single light, short story, um, different pacing. You do that Paul Harvey thing where you talk fast and, you, and then you cut it. You mm -hmm. talk fast and you cut it. Dr. Laura did that too. Yeah. So yeah. And that's the rest of the story. Uh, and that's the rest of the, the rest story. Of the story. Yeah, no, that it really works. Yeah. When you break it. It works really well in this environment. The Zoom, the intimacy of Zoom. And the fact that the sun goes down while we're doing this mm -hmm. helps. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. All right. Um, yeah, I think on that note, um, unless Chuck or Grady, you have anything uh, final to add? No, I don't. Go ahead. People have spent, sent me some wonderful things recently. This, you see this? <laughs> nice. A man yeah. carved this and sent it to me. So thank you. Amazing. This. A woman knitted this, gave it to me, I think in St. Louis or Louisville. The things you own end up owning you. A mortician made me a penguin because of Fight Club. And she sewed the penguin with uh, baseball stitches. And she explained what a canoe is. That after an autopsy, they take all the, they, they cut your abdomen open they take everything out. They empty you out like a dugout canoe. They look at everything. 
And then before they send it to the mortician, they just dump it all back in and send it on. And that's what morticians call a canoe because you're basically a dugout canoe filled with organs that are no longer related to each other. It's just a big salad bowl full of guts. And then they sew it all up with baseball stitches. So this demonstrates what morticians do best. Thank you. Awesome, and thank you for sharing. Thank you. And um, thank you both for joining us this evening. Um, and make sure to uh, go to the links that we dropped into the um, chat to purchase books and support these authors and bookstores. And remember that you can view a um, recording of this event on our YouTube channel um, after we wrap. Good night, everybody. Um, stay safe. Thanks Thank again. you, Lane. Thank you, Grady. Thank, Thank you, you guys. Much. It was terrific to meet you. So both really nice to meet you. And uh, would you see that House Next Door book again? Uh, oh, the Ann River Siddons House Next Door. And that takes place in Atlanta, right? Yeah, it's like the suburbs of Atlanta. That's an extraordinary book. People should look for that. Yeah, I think it's still in print. I'm pretty sure it is. I think you wrote a piece for Tor about the 10 best horror books. And I think that's where I first read about that book was in your article. Yeah. It's an yeah. amazing, amazing book. Well, I learned about it originally because Stephen King did that Dance Macabre nonfiction oh, book back man. in the early 80s, which was just like a reading list if you were lived in South Carolina like I did. Um, anyways. All right. Good night, you guys. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.